Good evening. You're watching the Digital Age, and I am James Goodale. Recently, Congressman Foley resigned from the United States House of Representatives because of inappropriate messages sent to former clerks. The Republicans have said he will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. But will he? What are the limits of virtual sex? To discuss that question tonight, we have two experts. First, Amy, who is a professor at NYU Law School, who's written an article generally relevant to the subject, The Perverse Law of Child Pornography. And Marjorie Hines, who is the founder of the Free Expression Policy Project at the Brennan Center of Justice, who has also written a book generally relevant to the subject called Not in Front of the Children. All right. Here we go. Now we got we to gotta figure out exactly what uh, Foley said that's relevant to our subject. So I'm going to put up on the screen an instant message which he sent to a page. Mm -hmm. uh, the page has generally been uh, unidentified. Uh, I believe he lives in Oklahoma. He was 17, apparently, at the time that this email was sent. So that's an instant message, I say. Okay, here it, here it is. Boy, I'm single right now, Foley, and so you're getting horny, Foley. Did you spank it this weekend yourself? Boy, been too tired and too busy. Then it follows in this email uh, message that's been on the internet, the, a full description of self-sex by the boy. And when this uh, description ends, Foley and the boy both admit they've been sexually aroused by this uh, discussion. Uh, there is then a second uh, part of the instant message that goes like this, sent to the same uh, former page. Boy, what are you wearing? Uh, Foley, what are you wearing? Boy, shirts and shorts. Foley, love to slip them off of you and gram your, that's male sexual organ that I left out. It was not uh, very politely put in there. Then we have a third instant message we want to talk about. This is the so-called San Diego instant, uh, in, instant message. Uh, the uh, instant messages that started all this the problem were really innocent, and we're not even going to probably talk about them. That was to a boy in New Orleans whose parents complained about it. But they're so innocent, uh, they didn't make our show. But this one did. Already, Foley, I miss you lots in San Diego. Boy, yeah, I can't wait till DC. Did you pick a night for dinner? Foley, not yet but likely Friday. Boy, okay, I'll plan for Friday then. Fully, that will be fun. Okay, so now we want to get a general discussion of uh, how the law treats these types of uh, virtual sexual communication on the net. And we have to sort of assume some starting point. And there's been an there was an article in the New York Times by Adam Liptak that said as follows. A Florida law makes it a felony punishable up five years in prison to, quotes, transmit material harmful to minors by electronic device. The law defines the material broadly to include descriptions of, and here are the magic words. At least I think they're the magic words. We'll hear more from you. Nudity, sexual conduct, or sexual excitement. Now, without trying to be the uh, world's expert on the Florida law or anything else, what's your reaction as a lawyer to whether this type of language that we've talked about uh, would be caught by this type of statute and the language that's there. Amy, we'll start with you. Well, under this law, which is basically a variation on a harmful to minors style of legislation that we see a lot of, it's possible that Foley could be caught, in my view, and Marjorie might disagree. Because it's so vague, it's really a variation on obscenity law, um, a variation on the old-fashioned obscenity standard as applied to minors. And the problem, in my view, with obscenity law and with this variation is how incredibly open to interpretation it is. Nonetheless, I think it would be pretty hard to get fully on this. Um, and I'd love to hear Marjorie's thoughts because I know she's thought a lot about it. There are other statutes and federal statutes that also raise interesting questions for me that I think we should talk about as well. Yeah, and let me uh, just 
can I introduce you again by what you said in the Absolutely. New York Times? Okay. Because it's relevant. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised, Ms. Hines said, if someone can get them criminally under a number of state laws, whether they involve the Internet or not, to prohibit unlawful, unlawful conduct with minors. Well, what do you well, think? Well, unlawful solicitation, really. Yeah, okay. I and mean, that's what he's doing. And well, the context is important because uh, if two 17-year-olds had this kind of conversation with each other, whether letters or by email or phone, you really wouldn't want to put them in jail or prosecute them or make it illegal in some way. This is a very typical kind of conversation for 17-year-olds. What makes this, um, I think, unlawful and potentially criminal is that he is soliciting minors for sex. So you've got an adult soliciting a minor which is a very different context from two kids who are dating. And you've got somebody in an employment relationship, so you've got sexual harassment issues. Well, so let's I, look, I don't think, I, I agree with Amy that former, these... Former Paige. Okay. Um, I, just, I said former Paige so we wouldn't talk about it. Yeah, but I think I, the, the context, the, the fact that there was an employment relationship, the context makes sometime. it important. Yeah. I agree with Amy that these harmful to minors laws, they're, very, they're basically targeted at pornography. The, the uh, definition is extremely vague and open-ended, and it would be dangerous to expand those laws to try to include this kind of conversation. But I think a law that's focused on the wrongfulness of, a, of an adult soliciting a child for sex, um, you know, I would certainly have no problem with that. And okay, so... But, but, I, but I think we should talk about this problem of soliciting a child for sex. Uh, yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, let's, can we... Uh, because we have here uh, yeah. two types of emails. One is... Uh, a general uh, porn discussion, can I call mm -hmm. it that? And then the, the second, which was the last one I read, says, hey, how about I'll meet you in Sa San Diego. Is that solicitation for sex? Well, uh, we see a lot of these cases, and the statute that they're often gotten under requires them to uh, solicit somebody for sex that is criminal, that would be criminal. Now, the question of whether sex would be criminal is very interesting here, because, for example, if he was planning to meet them for sex in D.C., the age of consent for sex in D.C. is 16. So in other words, it was perfect, It would have been perfectly legal for him, and we don't know if he did, but it would have been perfectly legal for Foley to have sex with these pages if he did it in D.C. So in that sense, soliciting them online to meet him for sex is not a crime. Uh, and, you know, if they were 15 or younger, he'd be in big trouble. But these pages, um, assuming the sexual contact, if any, in the real world but, uh, um, was in D.C. He's safe. Okay, but uh, let's, let's take D.C. out of it. Mm -hmm. And let's just assume there's some age here that will catch this uh, yes, conversation. Right. Okay, because, you know, if I'm sitting there watching the show, I can say, Amy, well, that's a weasel word because you, you turn the, the age so you could catch him, which is a point I appreciate, but I want to make it tougher yeah. and ask you and ask Marjorie, when he asked the boy to meet him in, in San Diego, is that a solicitation of sex? Let's assume that it is. Assuming the boy was below the age of consent in San Diego, the question will then, and I think this is probably what federal investigators are looking at, did he meet the kid? Did he make a step toward doing it? Because these cases tend not to be prosecuted unless the uh, adult quote-unquote travels. FBI uh, agents have heard talk about these crimes as travel and crimes. Really? Yeah. They, I you, mean, have to, you have to travel? Under the, I mean, in other words, go out into the real world. There's this idea that, you You've know... You've got to do more than just the email. They tend to look for somebody who's taken a step toward actually having sex in the real world. Is it, is it just taking a step? I understood you to say just taking a step uh, to having sex is, uh, is enough. I mean, I would have read this, okay, I'll go to San Diego. We, we still don't know what happened. Maybe they just had a Chateaubriand. Well, right. <laughs> I mean, the, that email on its face is not even sexually explicit. Yeah. You, 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 you know, the prosecutor would need a lot more facts, uh, even assuming that uh, the, the, the kid was underage and, and uh, it fit within the law. Right. I and mean, I'm looking at, at it not from the point of view of could you get him under this law or that law given the precise age yeah, and the precise yeah, yeah, terms right, of the right. law. I'm, but I'm um, as a matter of principle, free expression on the one side, exceptions to free expression. Right. Harassment is an exception. Threats are an exception. Extortion is an right. exception. Right. Um, I think this, a, a solicitation of a child uh, to have sex could be made criminal and it wouldn't be a First Amendment problem. Mm -hmm. If it's... But, it, but, it, but it's... But it's, how far do you have to the, go? It's but the how solicitation. Far you, yeah, but how far do you have to go uh, 
And that well, makes it different from giving a child a nudie magazine or James Joyce's Ulysses or a sex education pamphlet. Those are the kinds of things that should not be criminal because okay. there they're are for free expression okay, so, interests. So uh, in the San Diego one, if, if there's something more than, than this, it'd have to be something more than the, what we read, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, it'd have to be something more. If, then, 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 you, then you can get them. Okay. Uh, well, I thought that was I thought that was the easy one. I want to come to come to the harder <laughs> one now. How about the first one I read, mm -hmm. uh, which I think, to tell the truth, maybe the first time it's been read on television the way I read it because I can't find that when I see television. You have to go into the net to get it. And when you hear the politicians talking about Foley, they don't talk about this uh, particular email, which is pretty gamey to, mm -hmm. to uh, say the least. Now, what do you think of this one? Is this uh, criminal? Well, if we take the problem of solicitation out of it and just try to think about other yeah. possible strategies to go after this, the first one that comes to mind that I think would fail is obscenity law. Uh, people might say, well, it's, it's, so, it's so sexually explicit, and I think normal people might think, well, that's got to be obscene. It's so sexually explicit. But the truth is, it's not that sexually explicit in the scheme of things in the world in which we live. And to make matters more complicated, I don't think that people would prosecute this just for plain old obscenity, given that almost all obscenity prosecutions have to do with pictures, not words. I mean, there, there's been some recent exceptions, but really the fact that this is, we, we may not like it, we may think it's immoral, uh, using obscenity law, which might be one of the first things we would go to, is I don't think gonna work here. Okay, well, let's, suppose we go to this new world of the internet, the internet law, mm -hmm. whatever that may be. Now, uh, I have an article here from the New York Times, you were quoted in it. Uh, there's language that says in this article that if the uh, harmful to minors standard is met, then we're looking we're looking at listen to this uh, nudity, sexual conduct, sexual excitement. Now, in the email that I read up there, uh, each of the participants in the conversation, Congressman Foley and the uh, ex page said they both became sexually excited as a consequence of this interchange between them. Um, and I think that also there uh, was a description of sexual conduct because the page described well, sure. in great detail yes. uh, <laughs> autoerotic sex or self-sex, yeah, yeah, whatever you want to call yeah. it. No, that's not the problem. Um, there's clearly a description of sexual excitement. The problem is the harmful to minor standard, and we might as well clarify what that yeah. is. It is what we sometimes call the baby obscenity standard or the Miller Lite standard. We call it the Miller Lite standard because there's a case called Miller v. California from the Supreme Court in 1973 that defined or that attempted to define the line between constitutionally protected speech about sex, yeah. like in literature and art, right. and obscenity. Uh, which the court said is not protected by the First Amendment, but how do you define it? And of course, we all know Justice Stewart said, I know it when I see it. And that's about as, as good as the courts have been able to get it. So in Miller, the, the Supreme Court comes up with this three-part standard. And one, um, and the same standard essentially applies to harmful to minors. It's just a sort of right. for minors right. gets tacked onto the end. One, a sexually explicit description or depiction that is patently offensive according to contemporary local community right. standards. And that could mean anything. That is just as flexible as it can be, and it has created particular problems on the internet where there's no local right. community. Right. Uh, the second part, does it appeal to the prurient interest taken as a whole, not just an individual yeah. passage, and that's because well, when does. we're talking about literature, yeah. You know, one passage won't make it obscene. And the third part, does it lack serious artistic, literary, scientific, political value? Right. So this is the three-part obscenity and harmful to minors test. But to and you know, you if, you're, if you're going to try to include that discussion of masturbation yeah. in that test, you're going to be expanding obscenity law to take in a lot of communications um, that would raise serious First Amendment problems. So that's why I say that kind of communication should not be prosecuted under an obscenity or harmful to minors law, but under some kind of law that's more specifically focused on the inappropriateness of adults soliciting minors for sex. Oh, okay. Uh, was this conversation in which uh, both participants said they were aroused uh, amount to a solicitation? 
No, I got. I'm. I'm I, I mean, I, this probably goes on. Well, I don't know how often this goes on between adults and, and kids. I hope it doesn't go on a lot, but. Uh, I, I think probably we'll talk about MySpace. My, MySpace, mm -hmm. there's some indication maybe 6% of the, of the conversations on, on MySpace are of this kind of, of nature. So is this a solicitation or not? Well, you know, if the adult is 19 and the kid is 17. No, no adults more than 19. Uh, you know, it's the kind of conversation oh, okay, that yeah, okay, is just right, right. You know, yeah. normal, yeah, really. Right. Um, um, well, wait a minute. I want to find out if this is, uh, and I'm going to ask you, is is this conversation a solicitation in your view or not? Uh, I'm going to I'm going to uh, equivocate on that because <laughs> I'd need to do some research on how the law defines solicitation. Well, I think it's, it's not sense. it's not clearly it's not clearly explicitly a solicitation. I mean, if I just get on and I'm and I, I get it off by talking to some person, that's not that's not a solicitation. Is it? I think don't I have a First Amendment right to do that. I think that there, the law does make a distinction between talking about sex online and talking about sex to arrange an offline meeting. Right. And that's the distinction that prosecutors have looked at so far. Um, people who are really using virtual sex as a way to get to real world sex. I just want to go back to obscenity law and connect it actually to MySpace for a minute because what, what Marjorie was saying about obscenity law is true. And part of the problem is if you want to say this stuff is patently offensive by contemporary community standards, yeah. then you really have to look at what the world is today and how saturated we are with pornographic conversation and how in some ways typical this kind of conversation is. As you mentioned on MySpace, kids are communicating in extremely sexually explicit ways with one another these days. Now, it's, this is sorted because of the age difference and because of the power difference. But if you take that out of it and just look at the nature of this communication, like it or not, that's the world we live in of teenagers. And so for a prosecutor to come out and say, this exceeds contemporary community standards, this is patently offensive compared to the rest of the world, I think he's going to have, or he or she is going to have an extremely hard time showing that. And that's because, and really thanks largely to changes in technology, we now live in a world of all porn all the time. I mean, it's a really different standard now for prosecutors to have to meet. I, I, that's my opinion of obscenity law. Well, that's just, that's, I think it's an interesting point. Now, and you, you brought it up to begin with, which is that for this hypothetical law we're talking about that was in the New York Times, mm -hmm. uh, by your own test, we'd have to have meet patently offensive uh, somehow before it would go forward under your analysis where you applied, applied Miller. And so uh, I just want to ask ourselves again, because it's an interesting point. You know, I read that first email. It's a, a discussion of, of, of self-sex um, that uh, I, f I find uh, quite lurid and, uh, frankly, somewhat disgusting. Yeah. OK? But uh, but is that, that, is that, that the is, same as patently offensive? But that's, you know, garden variety literature. I mean, you go into any Barnes and Noble, and you can find novels without end that have that would be mild. Um, John Updike, I mean, Philip Roth, you name them. They've all talked about sex much more explicitly than that. So we have to be careful and not yeah. go overboard because we're outraged by what this man did. Well, then, uh, but you, you're talking about historically uh, the examples that you bring up. That uh, it's in literature, but Amy's being brought up a more current uh, communications as setting the standard. So. So it's not that bad way. Well, you know, it's interesting because the obscenity standard is so open-ended, and there's no real justification for it in logic or law. The First yeah. Amendment doesn't say Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech except if it's about sex and the community considers it offensive. Right. Yeah. You know, the justification for this law is morality and community standards, and it's got a largely symbolic justification. The society wants kids to know this is forbidden or not appropriate for them yet. Um, Maybe there's maybe that's enough of a justification. I sort of doubt it. But you, you have this very open-ended standard that wouldn't fly for any other kind of speech restriction. What the community considers patently offensive—that's usually the kind of speech. Well, are you saying? Um, that, are you saying that Congressman, we protect. Congressman Foley's speech is not patently offensive? Well, but that's the interesting thing: is a jury could say <laughs> that's this it. description. That's why we're doing the program. A jury could say, I suppose. I don't think this was the intention of ex-Chief Justice Berger when he wrote that Miller definition, yeah. but a jury could possibly say, if this were in literature, you know, we're not offended. Right. But when, it, when an adult, uh, 
especially somebody who's been in an employment relationship with a kid, sends this kind of stuff, that makes it patently offensive. We are offended by that, by the context. But, no, but I want to make a distinction between our moral disgust, yeah. our sort of emotional reaction to this stuff, and the legal standard. I think right. that you know, law doesn't precisely track morality. Obscenity law is one of the few places it does. And generally, that's a good thing. Um, and here, countervailing our moral outrage are serious First Amendment concerns that we don't want to go too far in inhibiting not just serious art and literature, but the kind of day-to-day -day stuff, like it or not, that is now part of the well, let me, let me fabric of society. I, let me see if I get you straight. Okay. Are you saying, because of the context which you placed Foley's remark that he, Congressman Foley, has a First Amendment right to say what he said in those first two instant messages that we put up on the screen. And, and let me just let me just make the question more particular and related to what Marjorie said, which is that she said a, a jury might find that. So uh, suppose the jury found it. Would you then say the jury? shouldn't have found it because Foley has the First Amendment right to say that. What do you think? Well, let me first of all say there's a difference between my heart and my head here. I mean, my heart wants to see this guy... Uh, I don't know what I want to see happen. I, I don't like what he did, let's put it that way. But no my head would say, um, if he were convicted on an obscenity charge, which is plausible, given how incredibly right. capacious obscenity law is and unpredictable and vague, in my view, yeah. I think he's got a very serious First Amendment challenge, and I would question that conviction. I'm not saying it can't happen, but I would say that uh, that would concern me from a First Amendment perspective because of the chilling effect it would have on so much speech that I think ought to be protected. So so as abhorrent as what he did is to me, I think it. I think to, to censor it on the grounds that it was obscene would be a threat to free speech. Well, so he has a First Amendment right to say it. Not necessarily. It, yeah, it depends you're just, you're on picking the wrong law. Yeah, that, there might be I other ways to get it. He had a First Amendment <laughs> right to say it. I think the kid had a First Amendment. The kid is the one who, who described his right. masturbation. Um, I think the kid had a First Amendment right to do that. But because of who Fo Foley was and the position he was in, I don't think he personally, just like, you know, in some contexts, um, distributing pornography right. is constitutionally protected. Okay. But in the context of an employment environment where there is, there could be sexual harassment okay. issues, okay. it oh. wouldn't be protected. Okay, so that, so in your, your, your case, uh, the jury decides that he violated the statute, and no court's going to overturn that for the reasons you said. Um, so you two, to you two, you two, well, well take employment well, me, out of it. I think, there was, I think there we was, agree if we take employment out well, of it. She's, she's well, there's got, also she's the got, adult kid thing. And there also is the question, I mean, there, there's also the question, a lot of this is going to turn on whether he met these kids for sex or tried to do so. It's, and then we can go back and there's a federal that. law that's going, that can prohibit him from using the internet to in, you know, solicit somebody or coerce somebody or induce somebody right. or entice somebody yep. to meet him offline, basically. I, I, I agree with that, but I'm trying to, to make it tough. Okay. Mm. We're trying to make it tough and just look at the, because this is a program in the digital age. Yeah. We're talking about instant messages. Yeah. And if a person such as Congressman Foley sends an instant message that is uh, disgusting, uh, you know, in the, uh, when all is said and done, is he going to be put away? The Florida law looks like a possibility to me, but again, it, it has to do with just the capaciousness and, in my view, unpredictability well, are there of any, obscenity. Are, you know, I think probably putting him away, he's already in rehab. I mean, Congressman Foley's primary crime was incredible stupidity, you know, <laughs> and lack of impulse control. The man has serious problems and he's now in rehab and he's right. out of the legislature, all of which right. is right. Um, but criminal prosecution. What's interesting here is these kids, frankly, do not seem to have been harmed for life by this. These kids are pretty savvy. They've got a good sex education. And, you know, there's always going to be pedophiles, and there's always going to be these kinds of semi-solicitations that are inappropriate when they come from adults. And the remedy is not to put these people in prison. The remedy is to educate kids and empower kids so that they know 
you know, when something is inappropriate. And in this case, they knew. Well, what are the what are the limits here? What are what are people permitted to do, and what aren't they permitted to do in this context? You know, one thing. What is an older man permitted to say to a younger person? I mean, I think he's limited by the, the kinds of laws we've talked about. One thing we haven't talked about that I just want to bring in that yeah. I think is important is child pornography law. Now, it doesn't seem to apply here, but yeah. it's something that people might think about. And one thing I wondered about is the picture that Foley asked for of some of these pages, not in the instant messages we looked at. If this page, and, and these pages were sexually active and were engaging in in masturbatory activities while talking to Foley online. If one of them sent him a picture of himself um, that might be interpreted as lascivious, then Foley could go to prison for possessing child pornography. And child pornography is an incredibly uh, broad standard. The, the, the kid pictured, and it's anyone under 18, doesn't even have to be uh, unclothed for a picture to constitute child pornography. So that's another thing that I would look for, and if I'm sure the FBI is looking for right now, just what kind of pictures How does he have? How about uh, Foley put in a law, didn't he? <laughs> would, would Foley be convicted under his own law? Well, Foley, I mean, Foley was really instrumental in passing, for example, one of the big uh, acts of this last summer, the Adam Walsh Act that was uh, aimed mainly to track sex offenders and to increase penalties against sex offenders. So, to be sure, would it come to an end? Would he be caught under his own law? Uh, if he was first found to be a sex offender, then he might have made life more unpleasant for himself. Okay, but we've, we've come to an end, so uh, you're supposed to tell me what the limits are of virtual sex, but I'm going to ask you something else. Do you think, uh, do you think uh, uh, Foley will see jail time? I don't think so. You don't think so? Marjorie, thank you very much. <laughs> do you think Foley will see uh, jail time, maybe? I, I think a lot's going to depend on his real world, not digital world activities. Thank you. For thank coming you. By. Thank you. And thank you for coming by and come by next week to learn more about the digital age. For the digital age, I am James Goodale. Good night. <laughs>